supporter for evening prayer daily throughout the year. I will rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his ongoing goodness and mercy. And although we ought always to humble our hearts and to humble ourselves and confess our sins before God, Yet ought we chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits we've received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite for the body and the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you as many as are here present to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of heavenly grace, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We've offended against thy holy laws. We've left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we've done those things we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. Thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of sinners, but that they turn from their wickedness and live, has declared in his holy word that he pardons and absolves all those who break their hearts, humble themselves before him, and confess their sins, and embrace Jesus Christ presented in the gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to ever grant us this repentance and this strong faith by the power of the Spirit, that those things we are doing at the present may be pleasing in his eyes through the might and merits of Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. We turn our attention to Psalm 10, 18. That thou mayest judge the fatherless and the poor, that the man who is of earth may terrify no more. Here, the psalmist applies the last sentence of the preceding verse to a special purpose, namely to prevent the faithful when they are unjustly oppressed from doubting that God will at length take vengeance on their enemies and grant them deliverance. By these words, he teaches us that we ought to bear with patience and fortitude the crosses and afflictions which are laid upon us, since God often withholds assistance from his servants until they are reduced to extremity. This indeed is a duty of difficult performance, 
for we would all desire to be entirely exempted from trouble. And therefore, if God does not come quickly to our relief, we think him remiss and inactive. But if we anxiously are desirous of obtaining his assistance, we must subdue our passion, restrain our impatience, and keep our sorrows within due bounds, waiting until our afflictions call forth the exercise of his compassion and excite him to manifest his grace in us. We'll pick that up tomorrow. And we are still with Joshua in chapter 10, verses 28 to 39. But this we may add, this is the sun and the moon standing still, that even the strictest and most literal interpretation of the world does not require us to assume, as the fathers and the earlier theologians did, that the sun itself was miraculously made to stand still. Uh, there's the camel snows in the tent. It simply supposes an optical stopping of the sun in its course, an optical illusion. That is to say, a miraculous suspension of the revolution of the earth upon its axis, which would appear to the eye of an observer as if the sun were itself standing still. Noble is no, by no means warranted in pronouncing this view of the matter an assumption at variance with the text. For the scriptures speak of the things of the visible world as they appear, just as we speak of the sun rising and setting, although we have no doubt whatever about the revolution of the earth. Moreover, the uh, omnipotence of God might produce such an optical stoppage of the sun, or rather a continuance of the visibility of the sun above the horizon by a celestial phenomenon which are altogether unknown to us or to naturalists in general. That's a bad word, naturalists. Um, Kantian metaphysics, huh? Metaphysics from hell, from Kant's heart, without interfering with the general laws affecting the revolution of heavenly bodies. Only what we must not attempt, as some have done, to reduce this whole miracle of divine omnipotence to an unusual refraction of the light or to the continuance of lightning throughout the whole night. Verses 26 to 27. The five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave that was at Machida. When they were discovered there, George, Joshua ordered large stones to be rolled before the entrance of the cave and men to be placed there to watch while others pursued the enemy without ceasing and smote their rear and preventing their entering into their cities. He himself remained at Machida, verse 21. Verse 20, 21, when the great battle and the pursuit of the enemy was ended and such as remained had reached their fortified towns the people returned to the camp to join Makeda in peace without being attacked anymore. There pointed not a dog its tongue against the sons of Israel. Leish in opposition to Levne Israel serves to define it more precisely. It is probable, however, to regard the Lamed as a copyist's error, as Hubegant and Moyer do, in which case Aish would be nominative to the verb. Verse 22 to 27, Joshua then commanded the five kings <coughs> to be fetched out of the cave and directed the leaders of the army to set their feet upon the necks of the kings and when this had been done, ordered the kings to be put to death and to be hanged on trees until evening, when their bodies were to be thrown into the cave in which they had concealed themselves. 
holiness of God is nothing to fiddle with. We're in Isaiah 2, 1 through 5, and he's presenting us as a second sermon, and they photograph in hints for the future or hints of the future, told in language of his day, the bringing of the Gentiles into it. The nation shall be admitted into it. Even the uncircumcised were forbidden to come into the courts of Jerusalem. The partition wall which kept them out or kept them off shall be taken down. All nations shall flow into it, having liberty of access. They shall improve their liberty and multitudes shall embrace the Christian faith. They shall flow into it as streams of water which denotes the abundance of converts that the gospel should make and their speed and cheerfulness in the coming of the church. They shall not be forced into it, but shall naturally flow into it. Thy people shall be willing, all volunteers. Psalm 110, verse 3. To Christ shall, to Christ shall the gathering of the people be. Genesis 49.10. See chapter 40, verses 4 and 5. Turning to our New Testament lesson of Matthew now. Uh, 1 2, Matthew 1 2. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas and the brethren. Only the fourth son of Jacob is here named, as it was from his loins that Messiah was to spring. And Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah and Tamar, and Pharaoh begot Aram, and Aram begot Aram, and Aram begot Amminadab, and Amminadab begot Naasen, and Naasen begot Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Ebed, Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. David the king begat Solomon of Urias. The words that had been the wife introduced by our translators only weakens the delicate brevity of the evangelist Ectes Uriu. Four women are introduced, two of them Gentiles by birth, Rahab and Ruth, and three of them with a blot at their names in the Old Testament. Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba. This feature in the present genealogy, herein differing from that given by Luke, comes well from him who styles himself in the list of the twelve, what none other lists do, Matthew the publican, as if thereby to hold forth at the very outset the unsearchable riches of grace which could not only fetch in them that were far off, but reach down even to the publicans and the harlots and raise them to sit with the princes of the people. David is here twice emphatically styled David the king, where the manuscript authority against the repetition is insufficient as not only the first of that royal line from which the Messiah was to descend, but the one king of all that line from which the throne of Messiah was to, was to occupy its place, the throne of David. The angel Gabriel, in announcing him to his virgin mother, called it the throne of David, his father. Sinking all the intermediate kings of that line as having no importance save as links to connect the first and last king of Israel as father and son. It will be observed that Rahab is here represented as the great great grandmother of David. See Ruth 4 20 to 22 and 1 Chronicles 2 11, 15. A thing not beyond possibility indeed, but extremely impossible, there being about four centuries between them. 
There can hardly be the doubt that one or two of the intermediate links are omitted. See verse 17 and remarks 1 and 2 at the end of this section. A photograph of history of the Messiah to come. And now we're back in the throne room above where angels, archangels, the church militant, the 24 elders are gathered around the throne and John has been taken up to see things that our eyes don't see. Number one, redemption to God. Christ has redeemed his people from the bondage of sin, guilt, and Satan redeemed them to God to set at liberty to serve him and enjoy him. High exaltation thou hast made us as to our God kings and priests. We shall reign on earth. Verse 10. Every ransom slave does not immediately prefer to honor. He thinks it a great favor to be restored to liberty. But when the elect were made slaves by sin and Satan in every nation of the world. Christ not only purchased their liberty for them, but the highest honor and preferment made them kings and priests. Kings to rule over their own spirits and to overcome the world, the evil one. This made them priests, given them access to himself and liberty to offer up spiritual sacrifice they shall reign on earth. They shall with him judge the world at the last day. I've forgotten that idea. And with Prof. Raymond and the doctrine of scriptures, the nature of the Bible's assertions about God and our resultant knowledge of God. Is biblical revelation about God univocal or analogical? Can we know God as he knows himself? Or is it an analogical comprehension that most of us hope for? Footnote 2. See, Summa Contra Gentiles. Is he referring to Aquinas here? The difference is this, a given predicate applied to separate subjects univocally would intend that the subjects possess the predicate in precisely identical sense. The opposite of univocality is equivocality, which attaches a given predicate to separate subjects in a completely different or unrelated sense. Now, lying between univocality and equivocality is analogy. A predicate is employed analogically, intends a relationship between separate subjects based upon comparison or proportion. Can the content of God's knowledge of himself and the content of man's knowledge that is gained from God's verbal revelation be univocal? the same, or must it be inevitably either equivocal, different, or analogical, partly alike, not alike, that is proportional to the specific subject's nature. Thomas Aquinas, 1224 to 1274, died at age 50, was one of the first Christian theologians to deal formally with the issue. He was not the first, of course, to address the issue of the nature and functions of knowledge, limits of language. Augustine, 354 to 430, dying at age 76, for example, had grappled with these issues in his treatise De Magistro, and incidentally had come to radically different conclusions. Aquinas declared that nothing can be properly predicated of God and man in a univocal sense. To do so and to say, for example, that God and man are both good and to intend by good the same meaning is to ignore the difference between the essences of God the creator, his existence is identical with his essence, 
and of man, the creature, his existence and essence are two different matters. But Aquinas saw, too, that to intend on equivocal meaning for good would lead to complete ambiguity and epistemological skepticism. Therefore, he urged the way of proportionality or analogy as the via media between univocality and equivocality. In other words, the assertion God and man are both good means analogically that man's goodness is proportional to man as God's goodness is proportional to God. But it also means that the goodness intended cannot be the same goodness in both cases. <clears throat> in some of this, in some of this, Aquinas was certain. Nothing can be predicated of God and man in the univocal sense. Rather, only analogical predication is properly possible when speaking of the relationship of the two. But now a problem arises for what is it about analogy that saves it from becoming a complete equivocality. Is not the univocal element implicit within it? My scholastics are added. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. It showed strength with his arm. It scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath hope in his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We're now talking about calling, external and general and external calling. How they're ordered together. The view represented in our confessional standards. Our confessional standards also imply that in the case of adults, the preceding, the preaching of the word precedes regeneration. But it should be borne in mind they do not use the word regeneration in the limited sense in which it is employed today. The Belgian Confession says in Article 24, we believe that this true faith being wrought in man by the hearing of the word of God and the operation of the Holy Ghost doth regenerate and make him a new man, causing him to live a new life and freeing him from the bondage of sin. Faith is wrought in man by the hearing of the word, and in turn works regeneration, that is, the renewal of man in conversion and sanctification. The canons of Dort contain a somewhat more detailed description in three and four, articles 11 and 12. But when God accomplishes his good pleasure in the elect or works in them true conversion, he not only causes the gospel to be externally preached to them and powerfully illumines their minds in the Holy Spirit, that they may rightly understand and discern the things of the Spirit of God but by the efficacy of the same regenerating spirit, he pervades the innermost recesses of man. And this is the regeneration so highly celebrated in Scripture 
and denominated a new creation, a resurrection from the dead, a making alive which God works in us without our aid. But this is no wise effected merely by the external preaching of the gospel, by moral persuasion or such a mode of operation. But after God has performed his part, it still remains a, in the power of man to be regenerated or not, to be converted or to continue unconverted. In these articles, the word regeneration and conversion are used interchangeably. It is quite evident that they denote a fundamental change in the governing disposition of the soul as well as the resulting change in the outward manifestations of life. And this change is brought about not merely, but at least in part by the preaching of the gospel. Consequently, this precedes. The order generally followed by reformed theologians Among the Reformed, it has been quite customary to place calling before regeneration, though a few have reversed the order. Even Macovius, Voetius, Comrie, and all superlapsarians follow the usual order. Several considerations prompted Reformed theologians in general to place calling before regeneration. A their doctrine of the covenant of grace. They considered the covenant of grace, the all and comprehensive good, which God in infinite mercy grants unto sinners, a good including all the blessings of salvation and therefore also regeneration. But this covenant is inseparably connected with the gospel. It is announced and made known in the gospel of which Christ is the living center and therefore does not exist without it. Where the gospel is not known, the covenant is not realized. But where it is preached, God establishes covenant and glorifies his grace. Both the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the covenant precede the saving operations of the Holy Spirit and the believer's participation in the salvation wrought by Christ. Now, the professor is still talking about the literature of church history. <coughs> Far less known and used than the annals of Baronius is the Historia Ecclesiastica of Caspar Sacharelli which comes down to 1185 and published in Rome, 1771, in 25 quarto volumes. Invaluable contributions to historical collections and special researches have been made by other Italian scholars, Miratori, Zacchini, Mansi, Galandi, Paolo Sarpi, Paolo, <coughs> Paolo Vucini, <coughs> the last in the Council of Trent, the three, Asamani and Angelo Mai. <coughs> Excuse me. French Catholic historians, Natalis Alexander, professor and provincial of the Dominican Order, died 1275, wrote his Historia Ecclesiastica, Veteris et Noa New Testamenti to the year 1600. <coughs> How could he write it to 1600? Oh, he died 1724. I'm sorry, I said 1274. In the spirit of Gallicanism with great learning but dry scholastic style. Innocent the 11th put it in the index 1684. This gave rise to the corrected edition. The abbot Cloud Fury died 1753 in his Historia Ecclesiastica in 20 volumes, down to AD 1440, continued by Cloud Fabra, 
very decided Gallican to 1595, furnished a much more popular work, commended for mildness of spirit, fluency of style, and usefulness for edification and instruction. It is a minute upon upon the whole accurate narrative of the course of events as they occurred, but without system and philosophic organization, and hence tedious and wearisome. When Fleury was asked why he unnecessarily darkened his page with so many discreditable facts, he properly replied that the survival and progress of Christianity notwithstanding the vices and crimes of professors and preachers, was the best proof of its divine origin. Footnote 1, a portion of Fleury's history from the Second Ecumenical Council to the end of the fourth century is published in English at Oxford in three volumes and on the basis of Herbert's translation carefully revised by John Newman, who was at that time the theological leader of the Oxford Tractarian Movement, and subsequently 1879 became a cardinal of the Romanist Church. And we are on critical notes in St. Patrick. Patrick does not state the instrumentality of his conversion. Being the son of a clergyman, he must have received some Christian instruction, but he neglected it till he made to feel the power of religion and communion with God while in slavery. Quote, after I arrived in Ireland, he says, every day I fed cattle. And frequently during the time I prayed more and more the love of God and fear of God burned, and my faith and my strength were strengthened. So that in one day I said as many as a hundred prayers and nearly as many in the night. He represents his call and commission as coming directly from God through a vision and alludes to no intervening ecclesiastical authority or episcopal consecration. One of the oldest Irish manuscripts, the Book of Duro, he is styled a presbyter. In the epistle to Caroticus, he appears more churchly and invested with episcopal power and jurisdiction. It begins, Patricius peccator inductus, hibernonione constitutus episcopos, cortissime re or adeo cap id quod sum inter barbarus utiqua gentis proselitas et profuga ab amorum dei. But the letter does not state where or by whom he was consecrated. The Book of Armagh contains also an Irish hymn, the oldest monument of the Irish Celtic language called St. Patrick E. Conticum Scoticum, which Patrick is said to have written where he learned was about to convert the chief monarch of the island, Logair. The hymn is a prayer for the special aid of Almighty God for so important a work. It contains the principal doctrines of Orthodox Christianity with a dread of musical magical influences of aged women and blacksmiths, such as still prevails in some parts of Ireland, but without an invocation of Mary in the saints, such as might appear from the book, from the Patrick of tradition and in composition intended as a breastplate or corselet against spiritual forces. The following is a principal portion we will take that up tomorrow. Wonderful hymn, I bind myself today. The strong power of the invocation of the Trinity, the faith of the Trinity in unity. Beautiful hymn, still sung. 
often, but it is some. Now we're talking about St. Gall again and the Reformation. We talk, talked about Vadianus or Vadianus. The death of the abbot, March 21, 1529, furnished the desired opportunity at the advice of Zurich and Zwingli to abolish the abbey, to confiscate its rich domain with the consent of the majority of the citizens, but in utter disregard of legal rights. This was a great mistake and an act of injustice. The disaster of Capel produced a reaction and a portion of the canton returned to the old church. A new abbot was elected, D. Thalm Blauer. He demanded the property of the convent and 60,000 guilders damages for what had been destroyed and sold. The city had to yield. He held a solemn entry. He attended the last session of the Council of Trent and took a leading part in the Counter-Reformation. Watt showed during this critical period courage and moderation. He retained the confidence of his fellow citizens who elected him nine times to the highest civil office. He did what he could in cooperation with Kessler and Bullinger to save and consolidate the Reformed Church during the remaining years of his life. He was a portly, handsome, and dignified man, and wrote a number of geographical, historical, and theological works. John Kessler, Kesselinius or Achinarius, the son of a day laborer in St. Gall, studied theology at Basel and Wittenberg. He was one of two students who had an interesting interview with Dr. Luther in the hotel in the Black Bear at Gina, March 1522, on his return as Knight George from Wartburg. It was only a friendly meeting of Luther with the Swiss. He had shown the same kindly feeling to Zwingli at Marburg. The cause of the Reformation would have been the gainer. Now we move to confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified dead and buried the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of god the father almighty from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead i believe in the holy ghost the holy catholic church the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting Under catechism. Fifty four. How is Christ exalted in his sitting at the right hand of God? Christ is exalted in his sitting at the right hand of God in that as God man. He is advanced to the highest favor with God the Father with all fullness of joy, glory, and power over all things in heaven and on earth, and doth gather and defend his church, and subdue their enemies, furnisheth his ministers and peoples with gifts and graces, and makes intercession for them. 55. How doth Christ make intercession? Christ maketh intercession by his appearing in our nature continually before the Father in heaven in the merit of his obedience and sacrifice on earth, declaring his will to have it applied to all believers, answering all accusations against them, 
and procuring for them quiet of conscience, notwithstanding daily failings. Access with boldness to the throne of grace and acceptance of their persons and services. I've got a footnote about how joyful these matters are and how very, very anti-Roman, anti-Herminian this is, how successful the king is in our, as our mediator. 56, how is Christ to be exalted in his coming again to judge the world? Christ is to be exalted in his coming again to judge the world and that he who was unjustly judged and condemned by wicked men shall come again at the last day in great power and in the full manifestation of his own glory and of the fathers with all his holy angels with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God to judge the world in righteousness. 57. What benefits hath Christ procured by his mediation? Christ by his mediation hath procured redemption with all other benefits of the covenant of grace. And we turn now to see what the Greeks are up to. The confession of Hanadius 1453. The one of the two confessions which the Constantinopolitan patriarch Canadius handed to the Turkish Sultan Mahmud or Muhammad II in 1543 comprise only a very general statement of the ancient Christian doctrines without entering into the differences which divide the Oriental Church from the Latin Communion. Yet they have a historical importance as reflecting the faith of the Greek church at that time. George, Gorgias Scalarius, a lawyer in philosophy, subsequently called Granadius, was among the companions and advisors of the Greek emperor John VII, Paleologus, and the patriarch Jeosaph when they, in compliance, with an invitation from Pope Eugenius IV, attended the Council of Ferrara and Florence, 1438 and 39, to consider the reunion of the Eastern and Western Catholic churches. Scalarius, though not a member of the Synod, being a layman at the time, strongly advocated the scheme while his more renowned countryman, Gorgias Gemistus, called Pletho, died 1543, opposed it with as much zeal and eloquence. Both were antagonists in philosophy, Gennadius being more Aristotelian, Pletho a Platonist. The Union Party triumphed, especially through the influence of Cardinal Bessarion, Archbishop of Nicaea at last exceed, acceded to the Latin filioque as consistent with the Greek per filium. But when the results of the council were submitted to the Greek church for acceptance, the popular sentiment backed by a long tradition almost universally discarded them. Scalarius, who in the meantime had become a monk, was compelled to give up his plans of reunion and he even wrote violently against it. Some attribute this inconsistency to a change of conviction, some to policy, while others without good reason doubt the identity of the anti-Latin monk Scalarius with the Latinizing Gennadius. After confessing our faith, let us turn to prayer. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. Lord, save them that rule. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. 
do thy ministers with righteousness, make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us but thou and thou alone. O God, may clean our hearts within us and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O God, our refuge and strength, who art the author of all godliness, be ready, we beseech thee, to hear the prayers of thy church universal and grant that the things that we ask faithfully we may obtain effectually. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, helper, sustainer, help our minds, thoughts, feelings, and our bodies. Give us insight and retentiveness of the memory. Help us to humble ourselves before thy presence. Humble knowledge. Help us to humbly grasp the range from the inner to the outer ends. Help us humbly to see theology in relation to math, science, history, psychology, law, medicine, and other spheres under thy sovereign providence. Humbly help us to see the underlying essences. Help us humbly to peer into human souls and minds and see what they're thinking and feeling. Help us humbly to see human motivations. Help us humbly to see behind lying masks. Help us humbly, O oh God, to look into our own souls and to make all speed to correct wrong feelings and wrong ideas. Help us humbly to repent, take the jump to the junkyard looking to Christ and him alone and his availing merits. Keep us from all fools, foolishness, liars, and proud poobahs. Shape us, O sovereign Lord, by thy all-sufficient and guiding word, and by the presence of thy omnipotent spirit, that we may ever daily walk humbly being as wise as snakes and as harmless as dove to our brothers and sisters. Cause us to walk with the learned, the godly of history, those who walked in thy faith, fear, and reverence. Help us to build up thy kingdom. Help us as opportunities are afforded to destroy Satan's kingdom. These things we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may know who those enemies are and may smile at them, disarm them as opportunity is afforded, and to spend our time otherwise in rest and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, we beseech thee. Search us, O God. Cleanse us. And defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, who's given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and us promise that where two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou art there, and will hear and will grant our requests. Fulfill thou, Lord, the desires and the petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here ends the order for morning, evening prayer daily throughout the year.